So hello and welcome to the final video of today's series where we're going to be looking at GeoHeritage. So in a slight shift from the uh, the topic of the previous videos in which we were looking at conservation paleobiology, how the fossil record can inform conservation practices, we're going to finish by looking at how we conserve geological uh, artifacts themselves because if we want to use the fossil record, say, we do have to also look after it. And this we can term our GeoHeritage. So let's jump right in. Geoheritage is a relatively recent concept concerned with the preservation of earth science features. I've put a fairly wordy definition of this on the slide for you here. Um, Geoheritage encompasses global, national, statewide and local features of geology at all scales that are intrinsically important sites or culturally important sites offering information or insights into the evolution of earth or into the history of science or that can be used for research, teaching or reference. Geological features um, that we can uh, say geoheritage applies to um, can run the gamut from igneous, metamorphic and sedimentary structures to a wide range of other paleontological, geomorphological or um, hydrological elements if we so wish. So we have this idea of geoheritage. This is geological um, heritage that is useful to us, look for, useful um, to us, and so we want to look after. The looking after of that we can call geoconservation. So geoconservation is the preservation of earth science features, that's geoheritage, for the purposes of heritage science or education. This is in this encompasses and is associated with geotourism. So this is, for example, the need to both encourage tourism to geoheritage sites, but also to protect them from visitors for future generations. The Giants Causeway in Northern Ireland is a lovely example of that. Lots of people visit it, so how do we make sure that we um, look after it whilst allowing people to enjoy it in, in their, their touristic endeavours? And it also encompasses history. So this is a, I guess it's fair to say, probably a fairly underwhelming example of an angular unconformity where two rocks meet or yeah, two different lithologies, rocks meet at, uh, at an angle. But it's a very important one because of its historical um, role it had in allowing James Hutton to come up with his idea of uniformitarianism. But geoconservation applies on all scales, from continents down to crystals. And it's important because, for example, if we go closer to home and what we've been learning about, fossils can be vital, vital to understanding life today and can inform our practices in conservation. But in order to use them, we have to look after them. This is true in a great many areas. To obtain scientific data that allows geoscientists to better know our planet, it's essential to guarantee access to geological materials, be they minerals, rocks, fossils, soil, landforms. And they are also key to education about the natural world. So all of this makes these features worth preserving. So fossils are a part of our geo heritage. But when we're talking about this kind of policy driven thing, an obvious question we have to ask is what does fossil mean? If we want fossils as geo heritage to have legal protection, we need to legally define what a fossil means and its status. So I wanted to talk quickly about what we do and don't have when it comes to protecting uh, paleontological sites of interest in the UK. So as paleontologists, we generally broadly agree that a fossil is a structure that represents evidence of ancient life. You can see some lovely examples of fossils um, on this slide here. Given the exceptional nature of the process of fossilization, a fossil is, by definition, a unique or rare and non-renewable natural object, and that makes it a highly valuable asset, and we'll come back to that in a minute. In contrast to our scientific definition that I've just given you, however, there is no definition of what a fossil is in English law. And I say specifically English there because it um, differs across the nations of the UK slightly, um, depending on which country you're in, the legal framework within which we consider fossils. More specifically, I would say that there is no specific definition in legislation that's laws that are created by government or other bodies of what a fossil is in England. Hence, this is a matter that is decided in case law. That's the legal precedent that's set by the rulings of courts and um, judges in the past. And in that context, an early legal case of interest 
to us if we care about what the bottle is legally is that of the Attorney, Attorney General versus Tomline in 1877. This gentleman on the left was Colonel George Tomlin. He was Lord of the Manor of what is now the Port of Felix Stowe, shown on the right hand side here. Um, the British War Department was a tenant on part of his land, and they'd constructed a circular fort on his land called a Martello Tower to defend the coastline. That land, however, was underlain by Pliocene deposits containing crop blights, and that's fossilised poo, um, which at the time were a really important source of phosphate for the fertiliser industry. So Tomlin being the, um, the entrepreneurial Victorian gentleman that he was, dug a trench to extract the copper lights next to the fort, and in response the War Department sued him. After a court case that resulted from this, the judge ruled that as the owner of the land, Tomlin was entitled to his copper lights, that he could go and make some, um, some fertiliser, but that he required the permission of the tenants to build the earthworks to remove them. As he hadn't done this in this particular case, the War Department was awarded half of the profits from the copper light sales. This precedent now means that in English law, fossils that are still in the ground remain the property of whoever owns the mineral rights, but they cannot be collected or extracted without the permission of the landowner and the tenant. And this affords them protection from all but the landowners in, this, in English law. Fossils no longer attached to the bedrock are a more complicated matter. In England and Wales, loose specimens are considered abandoned and therefore taking them is not stealing, whereas in Scottish law, all abandoned property reverts to the Crown. Um, so theoretically, if you find a fossil lying on the ground in Scotland, it belongs to King Charles, and you should um, theoretically ask for permission before removing loose, permission, sorry, loose materials. So that is the legal status, partly, of fossils in the UK law. Let's zoom out a bit and think about why we even need to worry about this. Well, geoconservation measures are needed because many geological sites worldwide are under threat due to a, a number of anthropogenic factors. When it comes to fossils, key ones um, that affect us as paleontologists are smuggling and illegal collection. Fossils, minerals and rocks are being stolen from many countries, feeding international smuggling networks that provide huge benefits to speculators. An example of um, why this happens is shown on the right hand side here. So these are the dueling dinosaurs from the Hell Creek Formation of Eastern Montana. It's a 28 foot long Ceratopsian dinosaur and a 22 foot long theropod preserved fighting. So quite an unusual specimen. It was sold in 2020, thankfully to be donated to a North Carolina museum for between seven and nine million dollars. This goes to show the huge amounts of money that are um, involved in dealing fossils and therefore the strong incentive towards breaking the law by smuggling these. Interestingly, I, I just wanted to mention as a side, these skeletons were subject to a court battle over who owned them after their discovery in 2006. In June 2020, a US appeals court ruled the fossils belonged to the owners of the land's surface right, not to the owners of the um, mineral rights to the land. So that's an interesting contrast um, to the UK law for you there. So that smuggling of fossils is a thing that we need to worry about um, when it comes to being paleontologists, but there are other anthropogenic factors that affect geoconservation. Examples include unsustainable mining. Mining of mineral and energy resources is vital for human development, but it has to be managed. Unethical super scientific research is also um, a risk for many geosites, which can be impacted by poor scientific sampling practices. Unsustainable tourism and leisure activities, um, mass tourism in areas with fragile geological features can be quite problematic. The example I've chosen here is the Grand Canyon that's shown on the left hand side here. Um, lots and lots of visitors can negatively affect many geological sites such as the Grand Canyon. Urban development, so rapid expansion of cities towards rural areas due to population growth and migration destroys geological sites. And often this is compounded by deficient statutory or law-based protections. We'll get onto this shortly, but the, the legal framework within which we look after our, um, our geological sites is both complex and often not well de designed. We also have cultural and scientific illiteracy. Decision makers and the society in general have a low awareness about and of the importance of geology. 
and we often have um, are stymied further by inefficient administration. Even when we have laws in place to protect a site, poorly trained public administration leaves GeoHeritage vulnerable. So these are the challenges that we face when it comes to GeoHeritage. So I wanted to finish by talking about exactly how we can manage our paleontological heritage and what legal frameworks we can use. So given that fossils are a form of geoheritage and we just met the risks, a key question is how do we protect and manage paleontological heritage? In terms of a single fossil, there is a long and complex process from the discovery of that fossil in the field to ideally its incorporation into a collection and its use in exhibition dissemination. So we have to find and extract a fossil, we have to prepare it, we have to place it into um, uh, into a museum ideally and that involves collections management study and publication and exhibition as well as dissemination all of those are very very important things processes that happen on the way to us being confident we're looking after a single fossil but more broadly we need to think about paleontological sites too so a paleontological site is a particular location or a group of nearby occurrences in which fossils of any type and concentration are present I've put two very, very famous ones on this um, slide for you here. So on the left-hand side, you can see the Walcott Quarry in which we find the Burgess Shale fossils. And on the right-hand side, we see the Solnhofen Limestones Quarry, which is in Germany, where there are lots and lots of um, famous fossils which we have um, made great use of over the years, including, uh, for example, Archaeopteryx was, was found in the Solnhofen Quarry. Not... All fossil occurrences, though, are paleontological heritage, just like we can't say all of the territory of a country can be declared geoheritage. So that places us into a position where we have to make a decision about which fossils and which sites have sufficient importance to be considered as paleontological heritage. Broadly, in most frameworks by which we make these decisions, there are three different groups of criteria that will inform that task. The first is scientific criteria. We often think about the nature of their, the fossils, if they're of exceptional importance, say, if they're very, very old, or if they have a high degree of preservation, or if they're the type locality for a form of preservation. That is a scientific criterion which makes a, um, a fossil site um, more valuable than it may otherwise be. There's also socio-cultural criteria. So this is um, things like historical value or educational interest or touristic interest about a site or its location or its fragility. Those are all things that may allow us to say, OK, this is a site about which we can. We need to place geoconservation um, uh, frameworks in place. There are also socio-economic criteria. So there are the economic value of fossils, but balanced those have to be balanced by the urban value of a site um, if it's being developed, say. And we also need to think about the mineral value of a site if this is a site that's associated with mineral explanation. Um, so there are lots and lots of factors that we can have to consider when we're designating um, sites to be interesting, paleontological, um, or more broadly, geoheritage sites worthy of geoconservation. And different countries have different legal frameworks to inform, which are informed by those criteria. And I wanted to finish by just giving you one particular example. Because this varies by region, I'm gonna focus on the UK. Um, and the UK is considered the birthplace of geoheritage and geoconservation. And that's because geology was born here. Many geological features um, are either type examples that illustrate geological principles that are globally relevant, or their sites where those geological principles were conceived and espoused for the first time, making them very, very valuable. And this has led to geologists forming governmental and non-governmental organisations to achieve geoconservation goals. And this has worked, I think, relatively well, although it has resulted in a complex framework of legislation that covers areas where fossils can be found. There are many designations and management frameworks and legal instruments that are used to govern and protect fossil-rich outcrops in the UK, but these are generally poorly publicised, hence we wanted to mention them in this feature. So this example here is um, the, uh, the Longmind in Shropshire, England. This is a Heath and Moorland Plateau, shown on the top right here, owned by the National Trust. And you can see from this image on the left that there are 
a number of different acts in blue that protect the long mind. I wanted to highlight just a couple of those. So, for example, shown in blue here is the Countryside and Rights of Way Act in 2000, which effectively places sites of international and national importance outside the hands of ownership and into the realm of national heritage. So this is key to the ownership of this particular site. The main designation that a uh, locality can be listed as for the purpose of geoconservation in English, England, is what you can see here, a site of special scientific interest, or an SSSI. Land with triple SI status is still owned by whoever owned the land before it was de designated in their triple SI, but there are restrictions on what people can do there, especially in terms of building and development. So, as you can see from this diagram, however, there are a large number of different interacting designations and organizations that are required to look after uh, a piece of geo heritage such as this. And this means that um, sites of special importance do have protection under the UK law, but it's not necessarily always as well enforced as we would like. So I hope that's been interesting and giving you some pause for thought. Um, if you want to read more about this particular um, element of uh, paleontology, this uh, paper by Jack Matthews from 2017 is I think a very good example. And I will leave it there. I hope you have enjoyed learning about conservation paleobiology and geoheritage. And I will see you on another website sometime soon. Take care.